thank you for the very, very kind um, invitation to join you today. And I think what we're going to do today is explore two things. What is why the world that we live in today is heading in a totally unsustainable direction? And I'm part of that. I'm a part of the incumbent business system that's not working for planet or for society at this moment in time. Now, the last decade, we've helped make Marks & Spencer relatively less bad. I am very proud of what Marks & Spencer has achieved. It's delivered 300 specific improvements to its business, socially, environmentally, won 300 awards, saved 750 million pounds. Lots of good things, but it simply is not enough given the scale of climatic, uh, social, um, biodiversity upheaval that we face. So I will talk about the challenge and why what we're doing today is simply not enough. And then I'll explore what the solutions are. And again, conscious we've got you know, a wide range of ages in the room. So my generation reflecting on why we've been part of a system that hasn't worked particularly well. A newer generation here from hopefully from the university is thinking about leading things a different way in the future. And I want to make uh, one really important point at, this, at the start of this. This is a lecture, but it's not. I'm not here to tell you that I've got all the answers, that you're wrong and I'm right in any shape or form. I'm standing here very humbly, having worked really, really hard for the last 11 years, trying to make Marks & Spencer more sustainable. And it's difficult. And for every one step forward we take, there's probably one that we need to take still. Now, let me just say who Marks & Spencer are, and then I'll, I'll, I'll very much reflect more broadly than, than M&S. So M&S is not a huge REIT business. We turn over about 10 billion pounds a year. 98% of what we sell is our own private label in product in our own shops and websites. That makes us a little bit different. In some ways, we're a brand, a bit like a Nike or a, a, a Unilever, that happens to have shops and websites connect directly with the consumer. But virtually everything we sell is our own stuff. It's produced in hundreds of factories around the world, uh, many food factories here in the UK, clothing factories overseas. We don't own any of them. We're not vertically integrated. Some of those factories we've worked with for the last 20 or 30 years, 100% turn, turnover for M&S. Some we pop into for six weeks, they make a fashion for us, then we move on somewhere else. Behind them, 20,000 farmers making fruit, veg, flowers, wine, meat for us. Um, and again, remember, we're not a big business. 4% market share of foods in the UK, and yet 20,000 farmers behind us in supply chains. And behind them, thousands of raw material sources. The fish, the cotton, the forests that provide the basic raw materials to make the products we sell. Roughly 2 million people in the supply chain making goods for M&S. As I say, some of them working permanently on M&S products, many not. The other direction, 32 million people shop with Marks & Spencer each year, by about 3 billion items from us each year. An item being a pair of shoes, it might be a ready meal, it might be a bunch of flowers, it's stuff. It's all got an impact socially, environmentally. Now, 10 years ago, we recognised, 11 years ago, we recognised that we needed to profoundly change the way that we do business. Just sort of shaving a little bit off your carbon footprint or your waste footprint each year wasn't good enough. We needed to be much bolder. And we launched a 100-point sustainability plan. Plan A, because there is no plan B for the one planet we've got. And with time, we've been proven to be right. It was the right thing to do. I say I'm challenging myself today to say whatever we've done in the past is merely a start. It's certainly not a finish. But we've been working hard to win all those awards, save that money, connect um, and drive coalitions of change across the wider economy as well, which again, I'll touch upon. So that's in a nutshell is who we are. And again, I think it's very clear that Marks & Spencer, like lots of businesses, going through a lot of profound change today. You know, we're having to sadly shut 100 shops across the British Isles, really profound for us. We've been in many of those communities for 50, 60, 70, 80 years. When we leave, it's emotional for our customers, our colleagues, and often a huge impact on those communities as well. But we're in a simple place now. Very soon, 33% of our clothing sales will be online. That's the way the marketplace has gone. We literally do not need as much footage selling clothing as we used to do in shops. Food, we still expand into. There's still plenty of opportunity for M&S to open new food shops in new communities. We keep doing that. But we are facing some very significant economic change around us. And that little parable of little old M&S is probably instructive of the great disruption that's happening in our lives generally, politically, we have Brexit, so the other side of the Atlantic, we have Trump, we have EU facing into many issues, we have China, we have um, trade wars, lots going on politically. Environmentalists I'll discuss and socially huge disruption as well, and I've got technology disruption as well. The fourth industrial revolution, the robotics, the artificial intelligence, the drones, the driverless cars, all the things that are going to revolution our li lives, if you use right, can profoundly solve a lot of these social environmental issues we're talking about. If they're used for bad, we could get make things much worse than they are today. So, 
you're a classical bunch, you'll know your, your Dickens, Tale of Two Cities, we live in the best of times and the worst of times. And let me just show with you a few slides, and I've been inspired and I've drawn a number of slides from a good friend of mine, Tony Juniper, uh, led Friends of the Earth, he's now at WWF, written a really compelling book about the problems that the world faces, do, do look it out, and I've just borrowed a few of his slides to make a point. And if you're sat at the back of the room, you won't pick out all the detail, but this is just population around the world growing. 1750s, not a lot of us around. By the time we get to the 1950s, population of the planet starts to take off. 7 billion today, heading towards 10 billion. Again, you know that. So I just want to put it in our minds today that more people consume more stuff. And as you consume more stuff, the economy grows. And in exactly the same way that population growth has been exponential, so has economic growth. The traditional measure of GDP, which I'm not saying is the right measure of success in the round for a society, but it's the, it's the measure that we use today. So population's grown, the economy's grown, and in some ways that's been really good for the planet. The number of people living in absolute poverty, grinding poverty, less than a dollar a day, has reduced, particularly in China. We've taken several hundred million people out of poverty, extreme poverty, in the last few decades. That's brilliant. And let's not underestimate that. In our, in our desire to challenge what we do today, there have been some important benefits of, where we are to, of getting to where we are today. However, and this is my world, consumption, I sell stuff. And again, this starts around 1900, it runs through to roughly today. Uh, up the vertical axis is the billions of tonnes of uh, resources that we take out of the, the, the earth to 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 billion. It's rapidly rising, the point being, whether it's, whether it's forests, whether it's cotton, whether it's fish, whether it's rocks, minerals, we're taking more and more stuff out of nature. Our biggest factory, to coin a phrase, to produce the stuff that we all use and consume, whether it's the phone, the car, the flight, the food, the clothing, it's all based upon nature. So, population's grown, the economy's grown, how much we consume has grown. And where we live has changed profoundly as well. Again, if you go back um, to the early part of the century, very few people lived in an urban environment around the world, you know, 10, 15, 20%. Uh, we've just gone th through a point at which more than 50% of people on the planet for the first time live in a city. And as I'm going to show on the next slide, to live in a city is to have a bigger impact than living in rural life. Now, rural life might mean for many people poverty. Getting into the city might have helped them get out of poverty. It's got consequences though. And this is just a, a, a little diagram Tony uses to, to make that point. Um, there's a little dot here on the right hand side as you look. London's geographical footprint represents um, London's physical size, about 1,600 square kilometres. That's physical London, a, a city of 8 million people. The much bigger circle is actually the amount of land around the world that require, is required to sustain and support London's needs. It's energy, it's food, the water that it requires to, to operate. As you can see, it actually dwarfs the size of, of physical London. In fact, in true senses, that's the same size of Spain of land that you require to support London, one big city. Now take all the other big cities around the world, they need another Spain to support, and clearly we haven't got that many Spains on the planet, because we're living as if we've got three planets, on the pla uh, three planets worth of goods to support us, we clearly haven't. So the more that we live in cities, the more it's got consequences for the planet. And the final slide from Tony's many, many good slides is just to show what this means in terms of the food system again, that Marks and Spencer and many of the businesses participate in. And this is just the amount of wheat um, that's consumed around the planet. And again, this is just 1970s, 1975, a doubling since then of amount of, of food that's been consumed, that's been grown. Now, there's been some big gains in terms of efficiency. We are able to produce more per unit of land than we were in the past. The so-called Green Revolution of the 1960s and 70s, pesticides, fertilizers, mechanized agriculture has brought improvements on the surface but has brought a legacy impact on the planet at the same time. So those few slides at the beginning are just introducing us to the fact that, you know, the world's got better, it's grown, but we're using much more of nature to get to where we get to, got to. So what are the consequences of that? And again, I'm speaking as a shopkeeper now, and I'm, I'm reflecting on climate change. And as I explain in a minute, climate change has got real implications for a business like Marks & Spencer. Famous picture of this, uh, here's a, a fella, you know, 50, 60 years ago, taking his boat out towards a, a nice block, big ice field up there in the Arctic. Um, here we are, the real, the same time, the same journey being replicated. 
The ice is dozens of miles back from where it was even 50 or 60 years ago. The Arctic is melting fast, which again has got profound implications for our global weather system. This is Houston, one of the world's richest, most populous cities. Um, a couple of years ago, hit by Hurricane Harvey. Took 61 inches of rain in a couple of days, 12, 1300 millimeters of rain. Even Plymouth, with you know, the, the weather systems that blow in from the Atlantic, takes nothing like that in a year. In a whole year, it doesn't get that much rain. And yet Houston got it in a couple of days. And even a rich city has overcome months and months of hard work to recover for a city. Sadly, you know, many people died, thousands displaced, the economic dam damage vast. And this is one of the richest countries in the world at the end of this. That's the world of climate change. And the same, what does it mean for an M&S? Well, I was out in um, East Anglia this summer with our farming base out there, just looking at the struggle they had through a, that great rarity, or won't be a rarity in the future, an English drought or British drought. And it was really hard for these farmers to keep delivering the onions, the carrots that we needed in our stop shops at the quality we wanted, the price point we wanted. They had to work really hard. The only way they were able to keep doing it is because 10 years ago, through foresight of themselves and our food division, they'd invested in winter water storage. They captured the winter rains, kept it back in reservoirs, and then let it out through the summer. Through many wet British summers, they'd not needed it. Suddenly, this summer, they really did, and it helped them trade through very, very difficult times. Again, we'll talk about resilience later, the, the ability to deal with that. That's one story from a farming base. Whether we go to Kenya, whether we go to Spain, whether we go to South Africa, we see drought. Our stores in Chennai um, were shut by extreme floods last year. We've had flooding of stores in the UK and the food factories as well knocked out by um, extreme rain. Wherever you look, it's getting harder to run a global food system because of extreme weather events, whether of rain or whether of um, uh, too much drought. And of course, you'll have seen the first image that I held up there um, at the beginning of the presentation, the wildfires that fires in the States. And again, you've got this concept that a city or a, a, a town in um, California, 27,000 people, can be destroyed in two hours by a raging fire. And again, richest country in the world brought to its knees by extreme weather. So that's climate change, responding to those pressures that we're putting onto it. A very obvious iconic image for any retailer to talk about plastics. And again, I know that there's some brilliant research done here at Plymouth, a world leading centre of excellence at understanding the implications of a plastic society for the planet. And all of us have known for 10 years that we're heading in the wrong direction in terms of planet plastic use. And many businesses like MS set commitments to become, make sure that by 2025, all our plastic can be recycled, reused. We tremendously simplify the amount of plastic in our business from 11 different plastics down to four. And one of those four will now go and soon be three. So lots of good steps were being taken. But when Attenborough exploded the bomb of Blue Planet 2, rightly, this time last year, suddenly everybody's looking at this world that we're living in saying, hang on, we've just gone too far. And I meet lots of bright people who say to me, Mike, Mike, you know, don't worry about it. There's all these problems in Southeast Asia. It's all about these mega cities like Manila and Jakarta that produce tons of plastics, thousands of tons of plastic waste every day. No recycling, no waste system, straight in the river, straight in the ocean. Their problem, not ours. Hang on. We're all part of the plastic system. And even though some of it is recycled here in the UK, not as much as it could be, Partly the councils could be better, but so much more of it is about the re retailers using less plastic in a smarter way that's easy to reuse and recycle. So there are enormous implications of this plastic environment. Now, we're going to talk a bit today about trade-offs. Um, we're going to re remember that the environmental movement has been littered by hopping from frying pan to fire. Once we got rid of CFCs because they're bad for the ozone layer in our fridges, we replaced them with HFCs which are not bad for the ozone layer, but awful for climate change. We've got out of petrol cars 10 years ago, we replaced them with diesel, slightly better for climate, much worse for air pollution in, in towns and cities. So we're beginning to understand that, that we can hop very rapidly from one problem to another in trying to do the right thing. Plastics, we have to be careful that as we correct rightly the problem that we have today, we don't result in, for example, more food waste because we take all the plastic off, food rots quicker, more quickly, it goes to waste more quickly. That is not an excuse not to act. It is just something to watch out for. And this is a league table that uh, Greenpeace have just produced uh, a couple of weeks ago, just ranking the 10 big food supermarkets in the UK on plastics. It's just to say, it's all transparent now. There's no hiding place. 10 years ago, you could always splutter and mutter and say, yeah, but I've got this program over here to deal with plastics. 
Green, uh, Greenpeace have been through us all with a fine tooth pr um, comb, looking at all our plastics policies, uh, the realities, the actions. The benchmarked us, you know, everybody can quibble a little bit about where they are in that place, but really, this is broadly where we all are today, and it's broadly telling us that we all need to achieve so much more than we do today. So that's the second story about environmental challenge. We've got a climate challenge, we've got a plastics challenge. The third great challenge is biodiversity. And again, I can't find the citation online as to where this brilliant diagram comes from. But basically it says, we all, we've all played Jenga in our time, those pull out the wooden blocks until it topples over in a, a fit of hysteria and laughter with, with, with family and friends. A whole way of life is exactly the same. You pull away the mushrooms and the mammals and the fish and the soil and the birds and the bees, and the precarious thing at the top called mankind and our economy all starts to totter. But the thing is, you can keep pulling them away for quite a while, nothing changes. We all think we're fine. And then suddenly you realise that there's no way back. You've killed 60% of the vertebrates on, on the planet in the way WWF have just highlighted. Bee populations and insect populations have been decimated by intensive agriculture and chemical use. And suddenly this whole thing falls over very rapidly. We haven't got there yet, clearly. But you're a brave person that doesn't turn around and say in 10 years' time, we're not potentially pulling out the last supporting brick of the biodiversity system that sustains our way of life. So climatically, plastics and biodiversity wise, the biggest factory I and every business uses is under strain. And I don't just want to make this an environmental presentation, I just want to pick out um, a fourth story as well, which is forced labour. Now we're not here in 1865, I look like I might be that old, but it's not 1865, end of the American Civil War, uh, emancipation, uh, slaves released in the south of, of, of the US. Today in 2018, 45 million people around the world are held in some kind of forced labour. Roughly half of that is domestic life, um, forced marriages, forced ser servants um, in people's homes. But half of it, 20 to 25 million people, are in private sector supply chains. You know, very obviously things like the cocoa industry, West Africa, people, but also things like the fishing industry in Southeast Asia. Huge challenges. And again, I just want to be very clear with you here. This is not something that just happens on the other side of the world. It happens in Britain. And all the retailers have to work really hard in the UK supply chains to make sure that slavery in everything from factories to four court, um, car, car washers, people are not being held against their will and forced to work. So environmentally and socially, the system that we all participate in today is creaking. So let me just sort of bring this, this sort of opening part of, 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 of the presentation to a conclude to say, that's just the tip of the iceberg of the challenges that we face. I mean, this is just a sort of a collection of some of the other stories. Top left-hand corner, we've got the meat-based product that we sell, just like everybody else. Um, we know that meat has got a huge footprint when it comes to climate change, emissions from the, the animals themselves, deforestation caused by producing soy that's used extensively in animal feed, chopping down rainforests, particularly in Brazil and, and um, the Amazon. You've got migration. You might say, come on, Mike, you're a retailer, shopkeeper, you don't need to worry about migration. That's something for governments and the UN to fix. It is, but we've got factories in Turkey producing goods for us. What's next to Turkey? It's Syria. What's happening in Syria? Dreadful civil war. People come over the border, very vulnerable, trying to escape death and destruction back in Syria. Easy to be abused if you're not careful. Huge issues to do with, with migration. Same here. Same here in the UK. There's real risk of gang masters abusing vulnerable people who have spent all their money and all their sort of ingenuity to get away from trouble in Africa or somewhere else to get a job in a gang picking fruit and veg in the UK farms, 12 hours a day, kept in forced labour. So migration underpins a lot of the social risks that we face as well. I mentioned climate change. Obviously, uh, the top right-hand corner there for you is just a reflection on uh, the new sort of technologies coming into our lives, artificial intelligence in particular, who controls what and what does a, a shift into the world of AI mean in terms of both human control and human jobs. And we've barely scratched the surface of businesses of what AI might mean for how we employ and how we run ourselves. We've talked about the plastic story, we've got Facebook and Cambridge Analytica up there again talking about data, who controls data. 
As we've seen, as, as questions have been marked about how political elections have been held on this side of the Atlantic and the other side of the Atlantic, people are starting for the first time to ask questions about the amount of data we're handing across to whom, how it's been stored for what use, it, it, what use of it is made. And just because I'm a shop and not a technology company does not mean that we're not having to think through how do we make sure that we're trusted to hold data in the future. The middle image, that's a, that's a bit of street art that we did a few years ago to illustrate the amount of clothing that's thrown away in the world of fast fashion in the UK. 10,000 garments every sort of 10, 15 minutes, hung them all up in the street in London to make a point. More and more questions about a fast fashion world, around 150 billion garments per year on the whole planet consumed, rapid increase on where we were in the past. This is not a linear progression in terms of one more person on the planet, one more t-shirt. People are consuming even more clothing, often for a shorter amount of time, poorer quality goods that gets thrown away after one, two, three wears. We have to find a different, a different way of running um, the fashion system. Time magazine there, just reflecting on the whole Me Too movement again. I can say this because I'm reflective of the past, the 20th century style of leadership, white, male, Anglo-Saxon, grey-haired. The world was mine. I think the 21st century, thankfully, can be very different for my daughter and for anybody from a slightly different background than mine. We'll have opportunities, I hope, that others in the past have not had. But again, business needs to reflect on how it's operating in uh, a Me Too environment. Joy of tax, you know, businesses, I understand why, over the last 30, 40, 50 years, spent as much effort as trying to minimise the amount of tax it hands across, to maximise the amount it gives to shareholders, to reinvest back in its businesses, I understand that. But really today, in the world that we live in, you're not contributing to doctors, to nurses, to the police, to the roads, the education system that underpins everything that allows our business to take. You should be proud about paying tax. Now, there's a right and a wrong level to be, to be discussed. But tax is right up there to me as a corporate responsibility issue. High streets. Um, I gave evidence in Parliament the other week about fast fashion. We've got a lot of challenge about it. You know, what, you know, Mr Barry, what is Mark and Spencer doing to ensure that the fashion system works for the environment and people? A colleague of mine was in Parliament today giving evidence about high streets. You know, Mark and Spencer, you're pulling out of 100 high streets in the UK. What has implications does that have for the communities there? And we might have lots of logical, factual reasons why we have to do it, which we do but it has implications for human beings and their community. Inequality, you know the stats, eight billionaires around the planet own more wealth than 3.6 billion individual people. And again, I'm a great believer that people should be rewarded for hard work, ingenuity and invention. But is that sustainable when you've got that level of gulf between the masses and the few? Again, big discussion. Again, Colin Kaepernick in, in the States, you know the story, kneeling during the national anthem to make a point about um, deaths of, of people from a black background, the, the, the sort of hands of the, the, the police force in the state. Very controversial in the American political environment at the moment. Um, Nike have run a big campaign on the back of him, saying this is what we as Nike stand for. Very controversial. A lot of people in America are very unhappy about that campaign. A lot of other people very happy. And it's starting to say that businesses start to need to have a voice and that voice can't just always be anodyne and keep everybody sort of sweet and happy. You're going to have to take a stand in the future. And then just the, the final picture in the bottom corner, just there reflecting on the circular economy. We talked about plastic store. It's not just plastics. It's any material you put into the economy. How can you ensure that it can be collected and recovered for useful second, third, fourth, fifth use rather than just sent to landfill or burned? So three in-depth stories, climate change, plastics, biodiversity, and then a snapshot of the myriad of other issues that swirl around the business as it tries to navigate through 2018. I go back to the words I said at the beginning. No business can possibly be perfect in this world. To be able to manage all of this and sell products in a very difficult trading environment stretches every organisation uh, to its limit. And that's why, again, I would, I, would, I would sort of single out our younger people in the audience here, the future politicians, scientists, business leaders, community leaders. You're going to have to be able to build a career dealing with this, the trade-offs, the complexities, in the way that my generation, the 20th century, didn't. But if that's the challenge, here's the opportunity. And I do believe you've right, the fourth industrial revolution that we've touched on ever so briefly can be transformative. And I'm just going to give a few snapshot examples of what I mean. Because fundamentally, we're at this pivot point in life. 
where simply becoming a less bad business because you've got a 100 point plan and you're 2% less bad this year and 3% bad, less bad the year after ain't enough to face into the challenge that I've just spoken about. But fortune favours the brave. Those businesses that embrace this great, this great uncertainty, socially, politically, economically, environmentally, will win. But they have to totally change what they sell and how they sell it. So first, let's start with an understanding of how people consume today. Um, and this is fairly, um, this, this, this hasn't changed over the last 10 years in particular. 10% of people passionately green or socially aware. Look for organic, look for fair trade, look for Marine Stewardship Council certification. Could as, just as easily and just as passionately stand up here and give this lecture about the ills of today's system. They're campaigners, the champions for change. A number of you are probably in this room right now. Interestingly, 35% of people are light green. Probably sat in the corner of this room nodding their head thinking, yeah, climate change, human rights, plastics, it's all wrong, we need to change. But I don't want it to be too complicated right now. Integrate it into my way of life, don't charge me more for it, don't demand a PhD to understand it, I'll come with you. 35% of people really concerned about the future, utterly through the lens of where they live. So talking to them about deforestation on the other side of the world and plastics pollution on the other side of the world and melting ice caps, it's a long, long way away. Born in Plymouth, live in Plymouth, die in Plymouth, what's M&S or any other business doing for Plymouth, that's what matters. So what are we doing collectively for Plymouth and for every other community where we trade? And then 20% not engaged, and we have to be careful how we define this, but because there are some very affluent, well-educated people who deny climate change. Say, so just leave it to the marketplace. The louder voice, smaller number. This is frankly a small a group of people who've got other preoccupations in their life. You might see in any society across the world, the poorest 20%, who have got just struggling to get by each week. Now, that is not to be snobbish and to say some of the poorest people on the planet do not care passionately about these issues. They do. But there's a significant group we need to respect for the fact that they're working really hard just to survive today and can't look up as much as they'd like to to make a difference. But they're the four groups that we're dealing with today. And if you're going to connect with them, and this is where I'm ever so briefly going to touch into the MS story and, and then come back out to the bigger issues, you've got to have a programme that connects with all of them. So, as we said, over the last 10 years, MS has been working hard on Plan A because there is no Plan B for the planet we've got. 100 commitments. Eh? But the latest iteration out to 2025, three big goals. Help 10 million people in terms of well-being. That's the food that we sell. That's mental well-being. Again, we'll touch upon a little later. Help transform the 1,000 communities where we remain. Even after we've shut a number of shops, we'll still be in roughly 1,000 communities in the UK, 500 overseas. Play a transformative role, a positive role in those communities, not just a shop. And become a zero waste business as well. Again, that's a shorthand for lots of other parts of, of, of the environmental issue. It means the biodiversity side, the climate side, but the headline for our business is zero waste by 2025. And this is how we've done it. And again, I don't want to dwell too long on this. This is just the theory of change within the business. And all it's saying is that's time along the bottom. Up the vertical is how sustainable we believe M&S is. No great science to it, just 0% at the bottom, 100% at the top. Unlike many businesses, early 1990s, we used to do community investment, make a profit, feel a little bit guilty at the end of the year, give some money out to a charity, often the chairman's wife's favourite charity. Moved on to something called CSR, Corporate Social Responsibility, in the early 2000s. That's when people like Greenpeace started ringing up on a Friday night saying, yeah, what pesticides have you got in your food? Where's your fish come from? Are you sure you've got no rainforest in your product? And you'd scrabble around on a Friday night trying to prove them wrong, and it was difficult, but you know, eventually you managed it. And that was the point at which we launched Plan A, 2007, to say, look, we've just got to get ahead of this, because just being nagged on a Friday night is not what M&S is about. M&S is about leadership, it always has been, always will be. A bit of risk management, a few nice policies doesn't cut the mustard. We have to have this transformative programme, 100 commitments out to 2012 to radically reduce the footprint of our business. 2010, we updated it again. We made sure that it was in, integrated into every nook and cranny of our business. So every M&S food factory is on the bronze, silver, gold ladder to become more sustainable. 600 factories in the UK and overseas. Every time it moves up that ladder, it's producing less waste, it's using less energy, it's investing its people to get better productivity. There's a business case. 
The factory is leaner, it's more efficient, better quality, better motivated people. The factory owner wins, the worker wins, the environment wins, we win commercially. Why wouldn't you do it? But every factory is on that journey. Another little story from there, every one of those three billion items I spoke about will have a plan A story to tell by 2020. Be very clear, not claiming that they're truly sustainable. It's saying that sustainability will not be a niche ethical range in the corner of a shop over here, and there's everything else, don't ask any questions. Every Marks and Spencer product is rising up the ladder of becoming more sustainable. Eventually they have one, then they have two, then they have three, then they have four or five environmental social attributes about it. Then you're starting to get close to being sustainable. 2014, we recognised that just becoming more sustainable on our own took you so far. If I'm going to confront the world of palm oil, which I'll talk about in a slide or two from now, or plastics, or climate change, or soil, or and, 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 I have to do it in partnership with the rest of the industry. And again, we work in something called the Consumer Goods Forum. It brings together all the world's biggest food and drink companies, the Nestle's, Unilever's, Coke, Pepsi's, Walmart, Tesco's, huge competitors, turning over about $3 trillion a year between them to work together on food waste and refrigeration and forced labour and plastics. Because if everybody stands together, and remember Walmart's 25 times bigger than M&S, everybody stands together, you get change moving forward as well. So real push on coalitions and collaborations. 2017, where we are, the phase of the programme we're in now, is really to engage our 32 million customers and 85,000 colleagues to get them to do this with us. It's not enough that it's just invisibly done by good old M&S over there and I just carry on with my life here. You have to become part of this journey. And then 2030, where I'm going to head very quickly in a moment, which is saying, and all we've done is become less bad through the first four or five phases of that planet journey. What is transformative M&S? What is the radically different product set, service set, retailing set that we need to offer in the future to be truly sustainable? And I'll touch upon that in a sec. So, just to bring that to life, coalitions. Been a great story in the last few weeks where Iceland has committed to ban palm oil. Take about 500 tonnes out of its, its, its food rate, its own private label food. Great. Richard Walker at Iceland has done what everybody else for 10 years has been talking about, but nothing has happened. Forest, what's palm oil? Never heard of it. It's in our food. Forest on the other side of the world. Here's Borneo. So what? What Iceland's done is thrown a great big brick into that pond and saying, for all the hard work that's going on behind the scenes, and there's a huge amount of hard work going on behind the scenes, it ain't quick enough. The forests are burning. So by making sure that everybody knew they're going to boycott palm oil, 70 million people have watched their non-Christmas TV advert. Brilliant. People are aware of this, this issue. Will I boycott palm oil? No. I use about 4,000 tonnes across our food business. The world's biggest brands use millions of tonnes, but use 4,000 tonnes. If we all walk away from palm oil, the palm oil won't disappear. It will just go across to China or India where no one asks these questions. So at the moment, all Mark and Spencer's palm oil comes from a sustainable source, just 4,000 tonnes. I'm not going to move a 20 million tonne a year at palm oil industry on my own. But you know what? We're sending a signal out there that change is required. A much bigger use of those are sending a signal that they want to buy good palm oil, not bad palm oil, associated with palm oil. Uh, deforestation. About 20% of the world's palm oil now is certified sustainable. 80% isn't. And that 80% is not transforming quick enough, which is why Iceland's brick in the pond is so very, very important. We all need to move faster. And even though Marks and Spencer has ticked the box making sure that our palm oil is sustainable, I'm not going to rest until we work with others to change. So, to boycott or to source is actually not an or answer, and or answer. You do both. You need somebody to excite the marketplace and think change is required. Well done, Richard Walker. You need a Marks and Spencer, a Nestle, a Unilever, a Tesco, a Walmart to stick with it and change that industry from within. And remember, the alternatives to palm oil, even if we get out of palm oil, require typically three or four times more land per unit of production. Because palm oil, just like plastics, is very good at doing what it's meant to do. It's just we don't run the system well enough today. Another example of collaboration. Again, I've talked about plastics. Now, Ellen MacArthur Foundation, you've probably heard of them, has brought together all the world's biggest food and drink companies, again, to commit that by 2025, all our plastics will be 
recyclable, reusable, or compostable. Here are just a few of the names that have signed up. About 240 companies now. Smaller version here in the UK run by something called the Waste Resources Action Programme, WRAP, brilliant organisation called Plastics Pact. Again, bringing all the big retailers and brands together in the UK to commit to transform together. You cannot build a circular economy if one business has go that way and another business goes that way. You have to work together. And again, another example, this is a letter that was sent to the uh, Daily Telegraph a few weeks ago from a number of businesses, including M&S, saying, we want the British government, through all the turmoil it's having to manage today, to make sure that environment remains front and centre of its thinking with the proper protections from a proper environment law for the future. And I'm a businessman. I want to make money. I want to sell products to my con consumer, but I know I cannot do it for all the reasons I've just shared unless I'm also positively saying to the government, we want to be part of a well-regulated environmental system. So let's just hop on now to say, Marks and Spencer is starting to put its own house in order. Good. We're collaborating with lots of other businesses. Good. But what we need is true transformation. And this is what Elon Musk has done. So what he's done is walked into this industry, the car industry, that for 10 years, like the food retailers, was steadily getting a little bit better. Cut emissions by 2%, 2%. That's if you've been truthful about how you're cutting emissions. What Musk said is 2% a year is not quick enough. I'm going to do something really bizarre. I'm going to launch a high-performance, beautiful electric car into this marketplace of petrol and diesel cars that are chugging along, getting a little bit better, and I'm going to rip it up. And everybody laughed at him. Everybody laughed at Musk and said, you fall flat on your face. And he's still flying close to the sun as an entrepreneur. You know, he's taking big bets and big risks financially as a company. But this car has utterly transformed mobility. Every other car company in the world is now scrabbling around to commit to getting out of petrol and diesel, launch electric and hybrid. Everybody is following the, the brick that Musk put in their pond. The point being that we're at the period of great disruption where chugging along, getting a little less bad, is being wiped away by beautiful aspirational alternatives that even the most ardent petrol head would want to own this car. Look on YouTube, watch it in the races against all the petrol heads, six litre, um, dragster cars out there, the Tesla beats them every time. People who like cars like Tesla. Same with what we've seen with renewables. Again, everybody laughed at renewables. You know, it's never going to be able to sort of power the world. You know, the wind doesn't blow, the sun doesn't shine. You know, we can't do it. They cost an arm and leg. You're going to have to pay billions to subsidize them, stick with coal and oil. In most parts of the world now, very rapidly, wind and solar are becoming the cheaper option compared to the old traditional approach. And if I picked out, as we walked into quite difficult climate negotiations starting in Poland this week, one really good story on the planet at the moment about the low carbon journey we've got, it's renewables, has gone from being niche to proven to everybody demanding to scale it, whether it's in Saudi Arabia, whether it's in India, people are driving these out because it's the best option. Now, there's one or two enabling technologies you need, like battery storage, because the wind doesn't blow all the time, um, the sun doesn't shine, but when it does, you want to store the energy you've got and then release it out there. Huge opportunities for entrepreneurs in terms of battery storage. And again, that's coming. And here are a few other examples of, of some of the great innovations we've seen. Just pick out the example of toast ale there. You know, M&S has got a big sandwich business. Think about all the sandwiches. How many of the sandwiches that you buy in a shop have got a crust? None, because the crust is waste. You just use the bread in between. In the past, the crust used to get thrown away. Uh, then everybody woke up and started sending it off to be used as animal feed. And the bright entrepreneur says, yeah, but why don't you take the crusts and turn them into beer? Great. So there's now products, toast ale here. M&S has got its own version. It's, it's food halls as well, made from waste bread. It's not to say that that on its own is going to transform the world that we live in. It's to say somebody's taken a waste problem and turned it into a fantastic product solution. Again, beautiful Eco building here, people, more and more people buying into. It's a great building to live in. It's clean, it's efficient, cheap to run, light and it's bright, it looks beautiful. Bottom right and corner, you see um, water in seaweed. So that's a new kind of packaging that you can actually eat the seaweed packaging as you drink the water, no waste. Same with the cutlery here, edible cutlery. You have your sandwich or your salad at lunchtime, you use the cutlery, then you eat it, it's gone. Again, it's still small today, but these are the kinds of innovations that we need to prosper in the future. 
few other business model examples. eBay, been around for a while now. Many of you probably use it. Probably doesn't think of it this way, but it's a giant circular economy model. All that stuff that used to clutter up your room and you think, I don't need that, throw it in the bin. Now you sell it online. You make a bit of money. Somebody else gets to reuse the product you've got. Circular economy. Everlane, hyper-transparent American clothing brand. Small, but it names every single product that goes into its clothing, where it comes from, how it was made, and how much it cost. So you always know the story behind Everlane's product. Remakery, you see more and more of these sets um, emerging. This one's in Edinburgh. Bringing together people who make things to sell directly to the marketplace. So rather than having to come up to a big business like an M&S or a Tesco to access the marketplace, you can produce small scale and sell small scale. You don't need these big guys to participate with. Rent the runway, turning over well over a billion dollars a year in the States now. Rather than owning clothing, you just rent what you need when you need it. Why have a dress that you wear once every two years and filling your wardrobe costs you a lot of money? You may as well just rent what you need. Great story here from our friends at Adidas. Over a million um, running shoes now made out of recovered ocean plastics. Again, they're taking a problem, ocean plastic. They're turning it into a beautiful shoe. When you finish with it, you take it back. They reuse it to make the next one as well. So great story from Adidas. Aerofarms. You know, Britain has a great relationship with farmers. Incredibly emotional connection with the land. Um, so do we. We work with, with many brilliant farmers across the British Isles. But all around the world, people are experimenting now in urban vertical farms. Centre of Plymouth one day, there'll be a farm that produces a lot of what Plymouth needs. Never sees a field in the classical sense. It doesn't need pesticide, doesn't need fertiliser. It's produced in beautiful conditions, high quality, minimum environmental impact. Again, a lot of people worry about the impact on farmers. And I understand that and I respect that. But change is coming. It's blowing through as we speak. And then alternatives to meat. I mentioned very briefly earlier that one of the most significant parts of a food retailer's carbon footprint, water footprint, forest footprint, is meat. Meat's important to our diet. Many people consume it, will well, consume it well into the future. But more and more people are exploring an alternative, whether it's for animal welfare reasons, environmental reasons, or human health reasons. More and more people are exploring. Now, in the past, people, you know, very committed, good people would say, I'm going to be vegan, I'm going to be vegetarian. To a lot of other people, the 35% light green I was talking about, it felt difficult. It felt you had to really sort of dig around to find it. it. Didn't taste great when you got it. it. Might feel a little bit expensive. Those days are gone. Vegan and vegetarian are climbing rapidly because it's again just like the Tesla. It's desirable. It's Instagrammable. It's lifestyleable. Lots of people are doing it for all the right reasons. Lower impact on animals. Lower impact on the environment. On their own health. But for many people, it's a lifestyle choice. The green choice has just become the desirable choice as well. And again, this is the story of Memphis Meats, but there's lots of other startups in the States who are investing tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars of venture capital money in the States, developing these meat alternatives. Some are synthetically produced in the lab, some are made out of plant materials. Again, rapidly entering the marketplace. So let me wrap up with just two slides which are gonna reflect upon what we've just discussed. We've discussed that business needs to change tremendously because of the environmental and social crisis around us. We've discussed that new models of business models are starting to emerge that are genuinely better for people and planet, but also good for your business because consumers want them. So what does Marks and Spencer and any business need to do differently? Integration, it's not enough to have a CSR department on the edge of your business sort of just cleaning up the mess that everybody else makes, making a profit. You have to integrate sustainability in everything you do, every factory, every farm, every raw material, every product, every customer interaction. We're all doing version 1.0 of that today. We need to do more. Build scale. Again, I've talked about making sure that this is not a little niche. Madam, you want fair trade, go to that corner of the shop. Every product in our store is on this journey to improve. Whatever you put in your basket is better than what it might have been in the past and what the marketplace norm is. You have to scale this. Transparency. Again, Marks and Spencer has named all the factories around the world that produce its goods, not just on a sort of long spreadsheet that's difficult to find on a website, a highly interactive map, easy to use. You click around on it, you can find not just the food factories and the clothing factories. You can start to go back now down to farm level. So we know where 7,000 beef farmers are in the UK that suppliers, ranging from 797 in Devon to 39 up in Orkney. Now, I don't tell you their name and addresses just yet. I know them. 
because I'm a little worried that people live at a farmhouse. They don't live in a factory. You know, a farmer, the family live in a farmhouse. And if few people feel very strongly about um, farming practices, it's a little unfair to visit the, upon that farmer by naming the address. Will that last forever? Not sure. I think with time, this, this concept of hypertransparency will say everything's open and very rapidly. Dialogue. Again, 20th century business was very much about, don't ask me, I know best, you know, you just buy my product. Early to 21st century business was very much about sharing stories on my terms. Let me just tell you how great I am. Here you are. Net, the business of the future has to engage in dialogue, and a lot of that is challenging, as, as I well find out. You know, for every good step m has taken, I'm pointing to five or six steps that need to be taken. Still, people challenge. They want to know when you're going to change things quicker and better. This global systems change is very important. Again, it's not enough to put your own house in order. I use the example of palm oil, and even though MS is now sourcing all its palm oil sustainably, I will still stand and fight and try and help the rest of the industry improve to stop deforestation. You have to change the system. Having said that, having said got to change the system, I've got to be useful in Plymouth. Every Marks and Spencer shop is donating surplus food at the end of the day to a food bank. It's creating jobs for people who might have been homeless, have disabilities to get into employment. It's fundraising for the local community. It's volunteering in the local community. What we need to do is galvanise other businesses to do that together here in Plymouth or Bristol or Bath or Glasgow, wherever it may be. We need coalitions to do that. And again, we've got some ideas about how we're doing that. But this final point is the most important one. We have to find radically different ways of providing clothing and food services to our customers. I emphasise that word services. The concept of just selling physical stuff and ever more of it has run its course. And we have to find a new way in the way that Tesla is a new form of mobility. What's the new form of food and clothing? And again, we can open up that in the discussion. And the last slide, which about you. And again, I, I, I sort of finish where I started by saying there's a broad range of, of ages in this room. And I don't care whether you're my age, a little older, certainly a lot younger. We can all be leaders on this journey. Um, we talked a lot about science in this, in, in this presentation, but fundamentally the journey ahead is about emotional intelligence. It's getting 7 billion people on the planet to recognise that we, Houston, we have a problem, literally, that we can change, and if we do change, things can be better. Not just less bad, but fundamentally better. You can live a happier, healthier life as an individual with your family if you join the sustainability journey. It's an emotional connection. Of course, you need the IQ stuff. That's why this, I mean, in this brilliant university, you need people who can join the dots to say, yeah, you've got a solution here, but watch out for this trade-off over here. You need people who can help you navigate through the, the many different dots that make up a sustainable system. Again, the other reason I'm here, never stop learning. I don't care whether I'm, you know, 50 odd as, as I am or younger as you are. What matters is every day you get up with a quest to learn and learn again, because the world is moving so quick, both in terms of problem and solution. Just coming out of a university at the age of 21 with a degree and thinking that's it for the next 40, 50 years, wrong. Every few years you need to relearn your career and what underpins it. Networks, again, as much as corporates need to network to build a better system, you need to do personally. And that can be at a university level, it could be at a Plymouth level, it could be a UK level, it could be an issues level, you know, whether it's plastics, whether it's you know, tackling forced labour. You need to be part of a system to drive change. In a way, tonight, us gathered here is a system. It's a gathering of good people trying to do the same thing together. As individuals have a point of view, and again, I don't stress that so much to you as an audience, because I think you all do have a view, but many business leaders have grown up keeping the head down. You know, just let's make the book, get a good pay wage packet at the end of the year. Don't have a view, because that might upset somebody. You've got to have a view now. Innovate. We all need to personally innovate. And again, I don't care what your role, your job, your background is in this room. The old way ain't working. You have to find a different way of doing things. And the final, final point, be resilient. Because the world we're all stepping into now, politically, socially, economically, environmentally, is tough. It's complicated. There is no neat pathway forward that's going to keep all the people happy all of the time. We all have to be resilient and keep coming back. Even if doors are slammed in our face, keep coming back. So I promised that that wouldn't be a lecture. I hope it wasn't. It's a set of observations for a fellow that's been knocking around for a few years now, you know, made quite a few mistakes in life. One or two things have gone well. I hope together we've learned something now. I'm going to draw a line there and then invite questions. Thank you very much.